Well, we've heard uh, two moving, fascinating addresses this morning. I'm tempted to just make a whole bunch of applications out of both of them and tell some stories of my own, but uh, I'm going to control myself. We're going to maintain our schedule, so I'm going to preach to you, slash lecture to you, from John 17, looking at Anthony Burgess, who is now my favorite Puritan, on Christ's intercessory prayer. Christ's intercessory prayer. John 17. Let's read the opening verses of this beautiful chapter of Jesus Christ's high priestly prayer. These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Lord God, as we address these beautiful words of thy intercessory prayer, we pray that this dear forefather, Anthony Burgess, who has such insights by thy Holy Spirit into thy intercessory prayer, may be used in these moments through my lips to edify these dear friends and to grow in every one who's gathered here as a true believer, a more profound appreciation for the ministry of thy Son at thy right hand. Please help us, and may Christ's intercession become a model for how we ought to pray here on earth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Anthony Burgess was a Puritan pastor and writer known for his scholarship, his piety, his skill as a preacher, as a teacher, and as an apologist. He worked for a time as a teaching fellow, that's kind of like a mentor advising students, at Emmanuel College, Cambridge. Emmanuel College was known as the hotbed for Puritanism at Cambridge College. Um, Cambridge and Oxford, you know, were divided up into lots of little colleges, and certain ones were known for the training of Puritan pastors in the 17th century. Lawrence Chatterton, seldom heard of, seldom known today, primarily because he didn't write much, lived to be 105 years old and was teaching students, Puritan students, until in his 90s and trained 2,000 
men under his charge, and they almost all became solid, robust, godly Puritan pastors. Well, Anthony Burgess is one of them. For 27 years, he ministered at Sutton Coldfield in Warwickshire. His ministry interrupted twice, first by the Civil War and second by the Westminster Assembly, where he took on a primary role. In fact, was one of the most important writers of the various articles of the Assembly and its Confession and Catechisms. Burgess returned in 1649 from the Assembly, kept on serving in his church until the great act of uniformity when he was ejected from his pulpit in 1662, where 2,000 Puritan ministers were expelled for refusing to implement total conformity to the Book of Common Prayer. He retired to Tamworth, where he attended a parish church for the last two years of his life and died in 1664. In those last 15 years of his life, he wrote a dozen books based on his sermons and lectures of earlier years. He combined in these books a beautiful balance of academics with godly piety. He wrote from a Reformed, confessional, biblical, experiential, practical perspective. He was a cultured scholar and an experimental preacher who produced warm, godly, informative, devotional writing. He wrote major treatises on the law of God, two major treatises on justification by faith alone, a very major treatise on original sin, some 600 pages, and massive discourses on 1 Corinthians 3 and also 2 Corinthians 1. But his magnum opus was a book called Spiritual Refining, more than a thousand pages on what is saving grace and what is assurance of faith. Some years ago, I took out all of his sermons on assurance, and I edited them word by word. It's now published by us, Faith Seeking Assurance. Very readable because it's written in contemporary language now without changing any of his meaning. Uh, it's now just a 200-page paperback, at least that part of it on assurance. Now, Burgess never wrote an entire book directly on the subject of prayer. But what he did do was he preached 145 sermons, 145 sermons on Jesus' prayer in John 17. It's a massive work. And I once studied it in the big original folio volume with all the old English, and I did a talk on Burgess on Christ's intercessory prayer. And that talk came in one of my books, I think, of Puritan theology. And about five years later, I was in Scotland, and a man literally tapped me on the shoulder, and I turned around, and he said, would you go out to supper with me? And I told him I was quite tired, but maybe I could. But he just looked at me. I suddenly changed my mind in mid-sentence. I said, okay, where do you, where do you want to go? <laughs> and uh, at supper, he said to me that God had used that chapter I wrote in a book for his own soul. And he wanted to learn more about Christ's intercession. And he wanted to read Burgess. And I said, well, uh, it's 145 sermons, but never mind, he said. I want to read him. How much will it take? How much will it take to get it into print? And I said, well, yeah, I don't know offhand. Oh, just tell me to the nearest 10, he said. Well, I said, maybe um, I would suppose... Uh, 
$20,000. Oh, he said, I'll send you 25,000 euros, and you get that into print. Yes, sir. I went to work on it, and I edited it for well over half a year, amongst other things, of course. I came to love these two volumes of Burgess. We printed it about two years ago. Because it's so massive, about a thousand pages, and two volumes, we figured we'd better only do a thousand copies, thousand sets. Well, they were gone in less than a year. And unfortunately, right now it's out of print, but we're reprinting it. And we've had lots of good feedback on it. I was sorry to finish the work. My soul was being fed by every sermon. Burgess looks at every single phrase of this prayer. And there's wonderful sections, phrase by phrase, sermon by sermon. For example, on the unity of the church. <laughs> I've got another talk on that. Insights that are just unbelievable on how to balance a right view of the unity of the church. But he also has this wonderful section on prayer, the intercessory prayer of Christ. And what he does is he looks at two things. He expounds John 17 as the prayer of Christ as our mediator and intercessor. And then he turns around and says, if we are believers, we ought to use this prayer as a model for our own prayer. So that's my, my two thoughts to you this morning. The prayer of Christ as our mediator and intercessor, and the prayer of Christ as a model for our prayers, what we can learn from it. Now, in John 17, verse 4, Jesus prayed, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Burgess writes, Christ Jesus came not into the world to have his ease and pleasure and outward glory, but he came here to work. And his work was to do the will of his Father who sent him. He came not as a glorious Lord and lawgiver, so much as a servant under the law to do the work of his Father to be a mediator for those whom his father had given him. And Burgess says, He is not only the mediator between God and man. He is not merely an example for us to follow when we pray to God, but he is the foundation on which we ought to build our relationship to God himself. For his very mission is to reconcile sinners to God and that ought to profoundly shape how we view his prayer and its application to ourselves. So under this first thought of the prayer of Christ, our mediator and intercessor, I want to break my thoughts down into four subpoints. Here's number one, the intercessions of the high priest. The intercessions of the high priest. Burgess insists that John 17 is a very special kind of prayer. He rightly regards John 17 as a mountaintop of divine revelation. He calls it a pearl of gold in the Bible. He calls it a pulling away of the curtain of the Holy of Holies that we may overhear the Son of God, our Savior, our Lord, our intercessor, pray to his Father. It's a sacred chapter. He says, The prayer of Jesus in John 17 may be compared to a land flowing with milk and honey in respect to that treasure of consolation that it contains. Seeing, therefore, this is such a fountain for healing and refreshing, come to this chapter with a spiritual thirst to be replenished in thy own soul. He goes on to say, these words are really 
in anticipation of Jesus soon going to Gethsemane, Gabbatha and Golgotha, and going through all of that in the last 24 hours of his life. These are really the words of a dying man. And if the words of a dying person are much to be regarded, how much more the words of the dying Lord of glory. So this is the prayer of one appointed by God to give eternal life to a multitude no man can number. It's the prayer of one whom to know is itself eternal life, as Jesus says in verse 3. It's a mediatorial prayer. And so it differs from the prayers of all other men. As they are bare, mere men, so their prayers are bare, mere prayers. There's no merit in our prayers, no mediation of power in our prayers, but Christ's prayer is far more of a transcendent nature than ours, even as the blood of the martyrs came far short of the blood of Jesus Christ. Their blood was not ex expiatory. It was not by way of a sacrifice for sins, whereas Christ was. So then in Christ's prayer, we especially look to his mediatorial power. This is not a mere supplication, as ours, our prayers are, but it's a powerful laying hold of and ob obtaining what is desired. For his prayer can no more be refused by his Father than can be his blood. So he can always say, Thou hearest me always. So Burgess sets the tone, you see, for this prayer by saying, this is a powerful prayer because the mediator is both God and man. His divine nature imparts infinite worth to his prayers, but also he prays as a man so that we can identify his affections and compassions, which are larger than any of our dearest friends can be. Can you imagine? Burgess is wrestling with this prayer, 145 sermons, and he concludes that the words of this prayer are so intimate, so holy, so sacred, that these words became dearer to him than his dearest friend to his own soul. He says, the sea is not fuller of water and this prayer is to my soul of soul enlargements going out to God. What a beautiful prayer this is. This is intimate. This is glorious. And after all, the whole world, all of life, is really ultimately about the love relationship between the Father and the Son. And salvation is about, he says, about being able to be, or being given, rather, to be drawn into that love relationship so that Christ is our elder brother and God is our Father and the Spirit is our indweller. Oh, what a glorious thing this is. Jesus, in his human nature, is enlarging himself sanctifying himself, maturing himself in his own prayers to his Father. But he's doing it for your sake, dear believer. For their sakes. Did you notice that in verse 19? For their sakes I sanctify myself. Here's a priest whose sacrifices were consecrated to God for his people. And he's doing his work here by offering himself, but also by praying for his people as their intercessor. So Burgess says, we have here a priest who doesn't only sacrifice for us, but he intercedes for us. And this intercession is often minimized far too much by the people of God. This intercession is a sinless immortal intercession of the great intercessor that the author to the Hebrews speaks of in Hebrews 7, 25 through 27. So Burgess goes on to say, 
and I'm summarizing his thoughts here. <coughs> Christ's intercession bridges the gap between obtaining the right to all spiritual blessings by his blood and his application of those blessings to our soul. Think about that. His intercessions are like the conduit that moves from what he merited on Calvary's cross so that through his prayerful intercessions to his Father, he, by the Spirit that he sends into our heart, brings those bloody merits to be applied to our soul, to our gain, so that he doesn't only purchase salvation for us, but he applies it to us so we live in it and we live out of it and we live for it and we live through it and we live unto it because Christ is all and in all. So Christ is interceding, Burgess says, for every single person, for every single person for whom he died. And he's doing that now in heaven. So that his beautiful heart in heaven is even more to us than if we could see him in the flesh on earth. And Thomas Goodwin, by the way, has a similar theme that he develops even more than Burgess in his precious book, The Beautiful Heaven, The Beautiful Heart of Christ in Heaven Towards His Saints on Earth. And what Goodwin argues, much like Burgess, but he fleshes it out more, is that you and I in our flesh, we would think, wow, that would just be incredible to see Jesus in the flesh. But when we have him in the pages of this word, and when we can go to him, when we can go to him and see his intimate prayers on our behalf in John 17, we have something more precious. Because his heart in heaven is attuned to the faintest whisper of a cry that we utter to his throne here on earth. And he delights to hear the cries, the sighs, the tears, the groanings of his people here on earth. Jesus Christ is interceding every single second in heaven's courts showing his father his own blood. And whether he does that with words or not, that's been long debated by the forefathers. John Owen has one idea. Some Puritans have others have another idea. But he's, however he's doing it, he's interceding. He's remembering you moment by moment. As God, he has the infinite capacity to remember every single child of millions and millions as if each one were his own child. And what a comfort that is. You know, Lance Quinn made himself vulnerable this morning and talked to us about the sorrows of seven deaths in a row. He also talked to us about times where he just cried out to God. Why, Lord? How could it be? You know... There comes times in our lives when we're in the Psalm 39 experience that we are so overwhelmed, we weep so profoundly, and our afflictions are so overwhelming that we actually come to an end of our own prayers. And we can scarcely pray. We can scarcely get the word Lord out of our mouths. But you see, it's precisely at that time and I'm sure Lance can identify with this. When we cling to the intercessory prayers of Christ, and we say, Lord, I can't even pray for myself. I'm overwhelmed. The water has not only come to my lips, it's over my head. I fear I'm going to drown, but do thou remember me at the right hand of the Father. And you see, the beauty, the comfort that he's remembering me, every tick of the clock, tick, 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 tick. No matter what I'm going through, and he will never, no, never, no, never, five negatives in the 
which means an extraordinary positive in the Greek. Forsake me or leave me, that I just surrender myself into his hands. In my prayerlessness, in terms of not being able to express any words, and yet prayerfulness, as I pour out my heart before God, that I find comfort unspeakable. In those times, said the Scottish divine Samuel Rutherford, Better let thy prayers be without words than thy words without heart. You sigh, you cry to the living God, but you don't do it in vain because Christ, every moment, is interceding for you with the kind of intimacy that he displays in John 17. Guaranteeing, says Burgess, that you will certainly receive the blessings from him which he paid for so dearly. So that's, that's point one, the intercession of Christ. Point two is the scope of this mediatorial intercessory prayer. Jesus says, I pray for them, verse 9. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. If you're a believer, you're the sheep of God. And if you're the sheep of God, he's going to care for you like this good shepherd. And that's going to be true through his prayers on your behalf. Burgess writes, Others are actually put into a possession of Christ, having new natures, and so enjoying a title and a right to him. Others, that is, other sheep that have yet to be brought. So those who were already saved when Jesus was praying this, and other sheep that had yet to come who would be saved, they are covered under the mediatorial intercessory prayers of Jesus so who continues now to remember them with exaltation rather than just cries of humiliation. And then Burgess unpacks that and says, He remembered you even in your cries and tears of humiliation, how much more, with his cries and tears of humiliation, how much more he will remember you now, the right hand of the Father, when he is full of his exaltation. And he pulls up the example of Bartimaeus. You know, Jesus was going on his last trip through Jericho to be sacrificed in Jerusalem. And there's a press around him of all kinds of people. And he's beginning to feel the weight of the sins of his people. He's bearing those sins on his shoulders as he goes to Gethsemane. But he hears the cry of one poor blind beggar. He says, call him unto me, Bartimaeus. And Burgess says something like this. If he can hear the cry of one poor blind beggar, a despised beggar sitting by the roadside, in the midst of a multitude of noise and confusion, with the burden of the sins of the people of God upon his shoulders, going to lay down his life, how much more in the glories of heaven as the King of Kings, can he not hear your cry, needy beggar at his throne? So, the scope of his prayer is that all those who believe in him and trust in him and pour out their hearts to him, those who are given to him by the Father, he will bless each and every one. You will never fall outside of the scope of his prayers if you're a true believer. Burgess writes this, He will give you every spiritual blessing through his own death and his own intercession. Though it was once uttered by him upon the earth, and he ceaseth, ceaseth to pray any further, yet it lives in the efficacy and power of it. Yea, that continual intercession of his in heaven what is, but, what is it but the reviving of this prayer of John 17? So that by virtue of this prayer, through the blood, we are sanctified, we are justified, and hereafter we shall be forever 
glorified. There is no heavenly or spiritual mercy ever given to us, but your Savior has been and is praying for it to come to you. Number three, the exalted position of our intercessor. Burgess goes on to expound verse 11, where Jesus says, I come to thee. I come to thee. He writes, Jesus is going to the Father, and he will be a potent favorite in the court of heaven for you, to represent you. Jesus' promise is for the comfort of his disciples and for believers today. It, it's profitable for you that I go to be with my Father. I go to your Father and my Father that you may come to be with me where I am. And then he quaintly, this is so Puritanesque, he quaintly refers to the shadow of Christ in Joseph by saying this, Our Savior comforts their troubled hearts with this, that he was going to the Father, not merely for his own glory and honor, but also for their good, even as Joseph was advanced in Pharaoh's court for the good of his father and his brethren as for his own glory. So the fountainhead of all our comfort is in this exalted position of our intercessor that he has gone to be with the Father. Because hereby, his Holy Spirit is given to us more plentifully and abundantly. Hereby, a second benefit of Christ going to the Father is enabling us with all holy and heavenly gifts being given to us in a sanctifying way or a ministerial way through public worship. Hereby, benefit number three, the benefit of Christ going to the Father is to prepare a place for his children. Hereby, number four, Christ goes to the Father to be an advocate to plead our case and our cause, even to the day of judgment. And hereby, number five, Christ's departure from the Father is not an eternal departure. He does not leave us forever, but he will come again and take us up to the Father also. So we ought to overflow with joy over the exaltation of our sacrificial and ever-living, ever-interceding high priest. Oh, Burgess concludes, oh, then what glad tidings should this exalted position of our intercessor be in our ears and in our hearts. Christ hath ascended to the Father, for that is as much as to say, neither sin nor devil nor grave could prevail over him, and therefore he has discharged all the work of a Redeemer that we need him to do for us. He's paid to the utmost farthing, Everything we needed paid for so that the love of God and the justice of God cannot but be satisfied by the atonement he has made. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to Christ for his mediation and his intercession. And then finally, number four, we then are called to pray through Christ's mediation. We must therefore draw near to God by believing that Christ is faithful as our mediator, as our intercessor, and our souls must rest. Our souls must rest, says Burgess, upon the exalted position and activity of this intercessor in heaven for us. And we rest upon him, of course, by faith. Faith is the hand that receives Christ in his fullness, both for our justification and our sanctification. Prayer without faith in this mediator is futile, but prayer that relies upon Christ as he enters into the treasuries of heaven is like a treasury itself. And so God's people, Burgess teaches us, God's people should daily consciously depend upon Christ's intercession for the acceptance of their own prayers to God. So when you pray for Jesus' sake, 
This is not just three words you add to do what you're supposed to do. This should be a conscious dependency. My prayers are accepted with God for one reason only. I am praying based on the merits and the intercession of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Burgess says, this is the greatest comfort we have when we come to struggle in prayer that the prayers of Christ sanctify all our poor prayers and they become accepted of God through him. As our tears need washing in his blood, so our prayers need washing in the prayers of Jesus. He prayed that our prayers may be received. He prayed that our unworthy prayers may be heard for the sake of his worthy prayers. Well, you can feel, can't you, the Christ-centeredness, the Christ-exaltedness that lies behind all the prayers of God's people through the mediatorial work and the intercession of Christ in John 17, but also expounded so richly by Anthony Burgess. And then Burgess goes on, and that's our second major point, second half of this address. How that, therefore, the prayer of Christ, though we will never pray like him, we'll never match him, we'll never have merit in our prayers, but the prayer itself of Jesus in John 17 is to be a model, just like, in a way, you know, the Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven, is a model prayer. This prayer we can learn so much from for our own prayers. So what can we learn? Well, again, four things. First of all, we can learn from it the necessity and the benefits of prayer. The necessity and the benefits of prayer. If Christ's prayer be thus all and in all, says Burgess, why do we need to pray? Are not our prayers then superfluous? By no means. And then he gives us some reasons. I'll just give them to you um, in, in, in bullet point form. Our prayers have no merit or mediation, but they have other objectives, he says. Number one, our prayers are to exalt and glorify God. That's a gift in prayer. We glorify the God to whom we pray. Number two, they debase ourselves. We humble ourselves before God in prayer. That's a good thing. Deuteronomy 8, 2. Three, we quicken the graces of God in us when we pray. Our souls are stirred up to lively faith, hope, and love. Four, our prayers give us what is more valuable than life itself, holy favor, holy communion, and holy fellowship with the triune God. And five, we pray to show our submission and obedience to the command and the will of our God. Now, Burgess, much like we heard yesterday, stresses the same thought Calvin did, that God not only decrees these prayers, but the very prayers themselves are the means throughout, through which he works out his decrees. His people, by praying, are involved in the means through their prayer for God's purposes and promises being fulfilled. Ask and ye shall have. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. Burgess says some acts of God are independent of prayer, such as God sending Christ into the world to save sinners, or the initial workings of grace in the beginning of our conversion, such that our prayers are not meritorious. God does not give mercy because we pray. But he does stimulate us as believers to pray so that he may give us the mercy he intends for us. Our prayers are part of God's grace to us as well as the answers he gives. For he gives us not just the opportunity to pray, but our actual prayers. 
And when those prayers promote communion with God, you see, even if they were never answered, they are a sweet thing, Burgess says. Another Puritan, William Bridge, says something similar. He says, tis a, tis a mercy to pray, though I never receive the mercy prayed for. Because communion with God is sometimes more important for the soul even than the answer to the prayer. Because it builds relationship. It builds intimacy. This is a glorious thing. Of course, an answered prayer is even sweeter. A bishop, Joseph Hall, said, God will always ultimately answer my prayers, either by giving me the thing I asked for or by giving me what I should have been asking for in the first place, which is even better. You see, prayer is a beautiful thing. And God makes sovereign use of our prayers to accomplish his sovereign ends. And so God has reasons for requiring our prayers to accomplish his purposes. Hereby, we acknowledge him as the author and fountain of all good. Hereby, he honors us when we pray, for we are admitted into his presence. Prayer is heavenly commerce with God. God will have us pray because prayer is an appointed means by him as well as faith and repentance. Augustine put it this way, Burgess writes, if Stephen had not prayed for his persecutors, the church would never have had such a glorious doctor as St. Paul was. You see, God has appointed prayer not only for our honor and our spiritual advantage and our profit, but he raises us up to prayer by his divine spirit through a heavenly frame of heart so that we in turn may benefit the church and bring glory to him and be ravished with his love so that others would see Christ in us and echo with us, my beloved is the chief among 10,000. Have you ever heard saints of God pray so movingly that it's moved you to pray? Well, Burgess says, prayer is a golden chain that reaches from heaven to earth. And although we think to move God to us, yet real prayer is moving ourselves to God. It's a ship that is fastened with the cable, does not bring the haven to it but itself to the haven. So the change prayer makes is not in God, but in ourselves. And then, second, the heavenly manner of prayer. Burgess speaks of that a great deal. The heavenly manner of prayer. I'll be very short here. He's saying the very definition of prayer is a lifting up of the whole mind and soul to God. He gets that already from verse 1. Christ lifted up his eyes to heaven and prayed, verse 1 says. This is what prayer is. It's a lifting up of the spiritual eyes of the soul to heaven. It's not running over a few words like a parrot. It's lifting up of the soul, lifting up of the eyes, moving the soul to this duty. Without the fire of the Spirit, who allows us to lift up our souls to God. Our prayers are like a body without a soul or like birds without wings. But with prayer, Burgess says, heavenly prayer, there's a heavenly frame of heart that fills the soul to delight in heavenly things so that we seek the heavenly glory of God and heavenly blessings coming from Him. So it purifies the soul, sanctifies the soul, moves the affections for the enjoyment of God. Prayer must not only be heavenly in its nature, says Burgess, but also in its effects. True prayer is like exercise to the body, making us more strong and active. It's like the rich ship that brings in glorious returns from God. It engages the whole person, and the character of the person who prays is crucial to the power of his prayers. A sinner who willfully continues in wickedness 
is an abomination to God when he prays. Oh, then look to thyself and thy life when thou dost go to pray. If the tongue that prays be a cursing, swearing tongue, if the eyes lifted up to heaven be full of adultery on earth, if the hands held out towards heaven be full of violence on earth, God is of purer eyes than to behold such. That's a warning. Prayer, true prayer, is the frame of the internal essence of the entire being of a person going out to God. So as another Puritan said, Thomas Brooks, God isn't looking for the arithmetic of your prayers, how long they are, or for the beauty of your prayers, how well worded they are, but he's looking for the sincerity of your prayers, how hearty they are. So prayer must be uttered in a heavenly manner with a godly sincerity. And then thirdly, Burgess says, we learn from this model prayer of Christ how to make intercession for the saints and for the world. Our duty is to pray, not just for ourselves, but for others as well. Christ calls us to be intercessors. And he encourages us to pray for those, especially those who belong to him, as well as the salvation of the lost. Shall Christ pray for his own, Burgess writes, and shall I forget to pray for them like he? It's to be feared that the godly do not look upon this duty of praying for one another as such a necessary duty. And therefore there are dissensions and alienations among them from one another. So I doubt that this great duty a prayer for one another should be neglected ever. And yet he complains it is neglected. And that's, that's usually why there's dissension between the people of God. So when they stop praying for one another. And he goes on to say, if we're all part of the body of Christ, you don't, you don't, if your finger's hurting and your left arm is strong, you don't look over at that finger and say, oh, you, you just deserve it and forget you. I'm not going to remember you. No, your, your whole body feels for that finger because it's in pain. So you should feel for every believer in pain and need and intercede for them. For God has made you a part of the body of Christ. And then finally, number four, Burgess speaks about engaging, engaging the God of glory by holy argumentation, taking the kingdom of heaven by violence. Now, by argumentative, Burgess does not mean prayers that arise from a critical or contentious spirit towards God. But he says, we have reasons for strong arguments with God based on three grounds. Number one, that God is our Father, and He will no more desert us than a father will a child. And so, with God as our Father, Christ as our older brother, and His disciples as our brothers and sisters, and knowing that Christ says to us, I ascend to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God, we have reason to plead with God the way a child pleads with his father. Abba, Father, my Father, my Father, have mercy on me. Help me. Deliver me. Go before me. Strengthen me. Second, we have reason for argumentation with God, using it in the old classic word of, of wrestling and pleading and in the sense of the prophet, command ye me the work of my hands, saith the Lord your God. On the basis that the spirit within us is the spirit of adoption. 
So we belong to the family of God, not only through the Father but, and through the Son as our elder brother, but also the spirit of adoption stirs our soul to pray with confidence and hope, with fervency and zeal, quickening within us a childlike reverence and humility, breeding a peaceful and quiet spirit, making us earnest to pursue a holy likeness to God, inflaming our zeal for God's glory and honor, and supporting us in all our afflictions so that we may trust that our Father is disciplining us for our good. That's a mouthful. But that's what the Spirit is doing inside of us. As He groans within us, groanings that are unutterable, and we cry out to God in prayer, pleading, taking hold of Him, as Isaiah 64 says, take hold of God in prayer. And finally, the ultimate objective of all prayer is the glory of God. Verse 1, glorify thy son, that thy son may also glorify thee. So our goal in praying ought not to be just our own happiness. That's a byproduct. Our goal in praying is the glory of God, the God we love. We should pray for the eternal enjoyment of God's glory. And seek that glory above all earthly glories. This glory of God, says Burgess, listen to this, is a universal medicine for all our diseases. When we can center on the glory of God, this is a universal medicine for all our diseases. It's a full treasury for all our needs this is the ocean in which we can swim forever. The glory of God. Everything else is but shells on the shore, says Burgess. Nothing else will fill our hearts. Nothing else will satisfy our hearts. The ultimate goal of prayer is communion with the altogether lovely triune God for His own glory. So in conclusion, the Bible has a high view of prayer. It involves the whole man. It involves the perfect intercessor, the Lord Jesus Christ. In him, we experience what is impossible with man is possible with God. With him, we experience it is impossible that a child of Christ's prayers and tears should perish. Like uh, the uh, uh, bishop said to Monica when she wept and prayed for Augustine. My dad used to say to me so many times when I was a teenager, the greatest problem of the church today, greatest problem of the world is is worldliness and unbelief. But the greatest problem of the church today is the lack of genuine, authentic, sincere, heartfelt prayer. He said, he'd say to me, we need a revival of prayer if we're going to see another great awakening. This, in a nutshell, is what Burgess is contending for in his magnum opus on John 17, take Christ, take Christ's prayer in this chapter, glean from it, many more than the four things I just gave you, a model for how to cry out to God for his own glory in your soul's good. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank thee so much for thy prayer, Lord Jesus, that incredible, amazing intercessory prayer, which gives us just a little window into thy heavenly intercessions for thy people. And what a comforting, what a comforting intercessory, mediatorial prayer warrior thou art. Lord Jesus, pray for us and all shall be well. And teach us to pray for others as well as our own souls, but supremely for thy glory. Help us to treasure 
thy intercessory prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.